you will start feeling your, your breath, your life force energy move up and down your chakras. And it will also release traumatic, um, you know, just um, stresses inside the body. And, and there's a somatic release that you'll have and you experience. And it's just so therapeutic and it's so powerful. And I started just diving deep, deeper and deeper into it. And I've also had another experience in person with a Zen Buddhist uh, Reiki healer um, that uses breath work for, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one clients to release and to realign themselves to a higher purpose. And what I love about this holotropic is that you don't have to use any psychedelics or any plant medicine. And just through the breath, you can reach altered states of consciousness. You can reprogram your belief system. You can reprogram and also release and heal because that's the biggest thing that I didn't even know I had childhood trauma that came up from the breath work and it got released. And it's quite interesting that our body can store in different parts of our body these traumas. And until you release it, they will stay in your body and it can create stress and it can create illness. And it's just been profound um, to tap into these uh, tools uh, for deeper healing, to do shadow work, to re realign and to discover one's true self, um, all through this power of the breath. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Unlock From Within. Today, we're joined by innovative tech entrepreneur, thought leader, and author of Zero to Engineer, Terry Kim. Terry is a tech visionary, breathwork specialist, and facilitator, and we delve into how Terry seamlessly blends spirituality and the principles of Kaizen across his businesses. His latest conquest, merging ancient wisdom with cutting edge sleep tech, co-founded alongside his daughter, June. He's pioneering sleep reprogramming to unlock human potential. Tune in to discover how Terry's blend of Kaizen, spirituality, and science is reshaping our approach to wellness. Let's dive deep into an enlightening conversation with Terry. Hey, Terry, welcome to Unlocked From Within. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show, Marty. Thanks for for being on. It's uh it's such an honor to have you, you know, on the show. Um and you know, I just finished reading your book Zero to Engineer. Um and I found it quite fascinating. Obviously my background, I am not an I'm not very techy minded or an like a, a, an engineer. I built a couple of my, you know, websites uh for, from my other businesses one's the nfpd snow brand and my personal website and also another website selling uh selling and facilitating portable ice baths um but probably only to about 70 percent, and then the rest of it i've you know used someone on upwork um to finish it off so um yeah quite quite i found it quite fascinating um the path that you went um you know, on your journey with zero to engineer. And what I really enjoyed about it, even though I'm not techie minded was, you know, you're giving people options that there's just not one route where you've got to go to university and then go into your IT career. Um, you know, it's quite a similar path. Like in another lifetime, I used to sell, sell and lease industrial retail, commercial real estate. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the other colleagues uh, in that industry did have a university degree where I didn't, I just went and got the certification and, and went through the motions. So I don't know. Yeah. I guess it's maybe a bit of a similar thing where people might just think, Oh, you need to go to university to then, to then get that job. That's correct. It's, it's, it's been indoctrinated into our, our education system, our upbringing, our parents, right? I think play a big major role in that um, mindset um, that, hey, I didn't go to college. I want you to go to college, right? So it's a projection of maybe even their own unfilled desires. And we have to think sometimes maybe, maybe the old way isn't the way, right? Maybe there is a new way. And it's not about shortcuts because there is no shortcuts to success, However, there are shorter paths, I would say, up a mountain. And if you can, you know, follow a mentor or find guidance where there is a shorter path, why, why, 
why waste the trouble of wasting four to six years when you can do it in four to six months? And so our whole mission is, you know, we'll train you and break you into IT in four months versus four years of college. And um, it's, it's, you know, like, think about real estate. Who, who, who goes to college for four years to go into real estate? They just get that certification license within months. And then they start, you know, shadowing an agent and then they start selling homes, right? So it's all about the practical hands-on. If you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, great. Go the college path because that is what you're going to have to learn and you're going to have to dive deep into the books. But when it comes to becoming a technical, um, you know, engineer of some sort, you have to get your hands-on, right? And that's that's where, you know, the skill sets really, truly build. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And so I guess let's, uh, you know, delve into your journey um, of how, you know, how you got to be an engineer. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't really have my dream set to be an engineer. Actually, I, I didn't even know how to t- turn on a computer um, until I was 21. Wow. Um, you know, I was back in Korea at the time and my dream was to be a K-pop star and like a world famous DJ. So I was DJing um, at night and recording music during the day. And, um, you know, it wasn't until I watched this movie, uh, it was kind of a twofold or two event process that really triggered um, my my life, you know, onto this path of being a, a tech uh, engineer was really um, watching the movie Matrix in 1999. And that sparked um, some curiosity within me. And, um, you know, at that time, my ex-wife got pregnant and it was like, hey, I need to look for a more more stable job, um, something that is more stable for a family. And that's when I started researching the Internet. And that was 1999. And it was pre.com bubble. And I knew it was the future. And, you know, when you when you spot something and you know it's the future, it, it can be exciting. So um, that's what really sparked my journey into the IT landscape. And I joined the Air Force, and that's how I um, broke into the IT industry. I, I joined the United States Air Force and started on the help desk and worked my way up to a network engineer and then eventually became an instructor. Wow. Wow. And like, was that was that still in, in Korea or was that in the US? Like, what was a bit about, you know, you know, your upbringing, getting to that point? Yeah, so I'm a military brat. My dad served in the army. I was actually naturalized as a U.S. citizen at three, but my dad was stationed in Korea for the longest. So um, I ended up just really, um, you know, growing up in Korea and Seoul, um, speaking both languages. I went to private uh, schools um, down in Korea. So, uh, you know, I was basically born, I was raised, I would say first generation Korean American in Korea, but didn't come to the United States until I joined the Air Force at 21. Wow. Wow. And like, how long did you stay, stay in service for? I stayed for five years and um, three years in the field and two years as a instructor. And that's where I actually learned that you could train people in months. So I was a technical instructor with a top secret clearance and we, we were training, you know, 18, 19 year olds out of high school. And wow. what do they know, right? So like, you know, in 16 weeks, we had to get them battlefield ready to be able to support mission critical networks. So that's that's where I knew and, you know, fast forward like eight, 10 years, like when I started NGT Academy, it was in 2016. and. I knew colleges were a scam because like I knew you didn't have to pay a hundred thousand um, dollar to go into you know college and get this degree to break into IT. And that's why I started NGT Academy. Yeah, right. Okay. And like did I know like obviously Asian background, I'm I'm half Filipino. Um, so like in the Philippines, um, there's a lot of pressure uh in terms of like from my mum um, over the years is of going to college, getting a degree, becoming a doctor and whatnot. Did you have any of that pressure growing up to, to go to university? You know, my, my parents weren't like tiger parents and they really let me do my own thing and explore my own passions and interests. I think the one influence they had was around the military, like, you know, 
my dad was like, hey, don't join the army. Um, if you want to break into tech, you should look at the Air Force. They're, they're the ones that are always working on the latest technologies. So that had some influence on me. You know, when I was young, my there's definitely that, hey, do you want to be a doctor or a lawyer? Those conversations did come up from my mom. And actually, when I was young, I wanted to be a lawyer. Like my wow. favorite, one of my favorite TV shows, Suits. Yeah. Um, and I really loved that show. And um, yeah, but I never, it's because my mom always thought that I had this, uh, you know, like this interest or I, I was really good at influence and and. And, and and like winning arguments. <laughs> so she said, like, you'd be perfect to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but I never went down that path. Um, once I discovered uh, IT, I knew I, I knew I wanted to be in tech. Awesome. Awesome. And like, that was just all around what inspired you in the movie, uh, The Matrix? The Matrix. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's powerful. It's That's a great, cool. it's a great movie. It's like one of those movies where you know, I feel like you can keep going back and watching over the years and you still find something new in it or learn something new in it. Um, just like a great book. Um, you know, if you always go back over the years and you can keep going back, you'll find, you'll find some piece of nugget in there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's a good metaphor for, um, you know, a lot of, uh, like just perspective of the world and whatnot. And, it was a huge um, catalyst for me, at least watching that and um, wanting to break into IT, wanting to become a hacker, wanting to be like that coder. And like, it, it was just, it was a spark, I would say. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome stuff. And so like, where did the journey unfold after that? After, you know, you, you served your time, then, then where did you go after that? Well, I started my first brick and mortar business. I was, you know, really fond of internet cafes in Korea. They're like on every block and they weren't quite mainstream in 2000 in, in the United States. So I had this big idea of launching a franchise network of, uh, you know, these PC cafes. Um, and I ended up just opening up my first internet cafe outside of Kiesler Air Force Base, where I was an instructor. And um, business was booming. Actually, that business took off like a rocket ship. We couldn't, we had people waiting in line or waiting on the sofas to wait for a station to be open. And we would have land parties, um, till sunrise on weekends. And, and it was a blast until hurricane Katrina hit and it wiped that business out. And I had to go get a job. And, um, I, I, I latched onto my original dream of working for Cisco systems one day. And I said, you know what? I've learned network engineering in the military. I was an instructor. Let, let me figure this out on the civilian sector. But, you know, quite funny, I had to start from the ground up. I actually got my first network technician job. So it was kind of a demotion because I was an engineer in the Air Force and an instructor. But I took that technician job at 28K per year and um, climbed the ranks and broke six figures within a two-year time frame. So I tell students all the time, you could start off with an entry-level job and break six figures within a couple of years before your peers even graduate from college. So uh, that's how I um, got into the civilian sector. And at 31, I reached my dream job. So it took a decade. Um, I think the best things or best dreams, big wild dreams, uh, take about a decade to accomplish. And so at 31, I accomplished that dream. And it was at that time, once I got into that uh, dream job was like, hey, is this it? Is this, do mm. I just retire and work here for 40 years? And that's when my entrepreneur, um, you know, bug hit me and, and wanted to make more impact and legacy. And so that's when I got the big idea of starting NGT Academy. Awesome. That's awesome stuff. And like, I know, like you say in, in, um, in your book, Zero to Engineer, like there was a piece there that actually stood out for me where you said like, to move up the ranks um, in IT and not get stuck, obviously, uh, one of the sections is like, don't go and work in the help desk area. Um, but the other thing that you did speak about in it was like your any any goals or milestones that you hit, you said like write down and record you know, those dates of the things that you've ticked off or you've accomplished, like, where did you learn to know from the get go? Okay. Each time I hit a milestone or an accomplishment, I should jot that down and sort of create a, 
I guess, a list of all your the things that you've achieved. So when you do have those um, quarterly meetings with your, I guess, with management and whatnot about how your performance is, um, yeah, how did how did that all come about? I think it came from just being ambitious and hungry in my career early on in my 20s. I started using Evernote 2004 started using it to really journal. And uh, I talk about it in the book. It's like really understanding your goals because when we write to paper, it's like a subconscious program that's happening. As you write that, you're really manifesting. So like words are spells and also writing is like magic. It's like taking what you, you're thinking about and writing it. And it's also imprinting on the subconscious mind, which is basically your belief system. It's what power empowers you. It allows you to move uh, through the hard times. So I'm a big advocate of uh, journaling. Um, also affirmations like journaling, journaling in the evening, writing down the top three things you want to work on when you wake up. Um, things that maybe you're grateful for as well. So gratitude is a big part of my practice in part of journaling as well. And I think from that space, we can create more abundance and, and make more things happen for us personally in our career and also in our personal lives. Awesome. And like, you know, like I, I think I just touched on it earlier, you know, you, you said like, if you are wanting to get into IT, um, becoming an engineer, not, not go, not go straight for that help desk job. Um, mm. Like, how did you learn about that? Like to bypass that section? So great question. In the military, I had to start on the help desk and I hated it. Within six months, I literally hated my job because I was like, this is like Groundhog's Day on, on repeat. I'm just like troubleshooting PCs and printers. In the beginning, it was fun. But as soon as I realized that that was just tier one, that's just the front line. Like I wanted to be in the back end. I wanted to understand the technologies, the infrastructure, how these packets moved in the network, how to secure it, how to protect it. Um, Cause that was my hacker mind. Like I knew there was hackers on the internet and cybersecurity was going to be huge. And so I wanted to be on the, you know, on the good guys team, the, the blue team, um, so to speak, versus the red team when we're talking about cybersecurity and technology and uh, the help desk, Going back to it, I've seen so many students or aspiring IT professionals, they stay stuck on the help desk and they think that they have to be there for years before they move up. And it it, it is just a, um, it's just not true. Um, and you can skip the help desk by just positioning yourself as a junior engineer. And if you can step into a role where you're at least an administrator admitting uh, administrating the network or the servers or the cloud or whatever IT uh, infrastructure is that you're going to be able to move up much faster um, versus being stuck on the help desk. And the big fatal mistake that a lot of people make, which I highlight in the book, and I'll just spill the beans here, is they go after the CompTIA A+, because that's an entry-level certification. Once they get that cert, you know, they basically position themselves for help desk roles. And my advice is you can skip the help desk and move right into a higher level or entry level roles, such as network technician, which is what I started off in the civilian sector, network administrator, um, junior engineer, associate engineer positions, and you'll be able to climb the rank much quicker. Awesome. Awesome stuff. And like, you know, how you said when you were stuck in the help desk section early in your career and, and you hated it, how, how did you, like, was there moments there where you felt like, oh, maybe IT isn't for me, an IT career? Like, did you have those self, that self-doubt? I didn't have self-doubt in that because I knew that the help desk was a temporary position. And when I looked at the network and server guys, I knew they were, they were making three, four times more than me. And I knew that I would get into that role one day. So, you know, outside of my, my help desk duties, I would go talk to the server guys and like, Hey, what are you doing for the exchange email? Like, and I would ask all the questions and I would also try to shadow them when they're, you know, working on a, a building cutover. I'd be like, Hey, can I tag along? 
uh, just for an hour, see what you guys are doing over there. And that's how I really immersed myself. But it was really seeing the big picture, seeing the end goal in mind, seeing that I wanted to be a Cisco engineer one day. And, and if you have that end goal in mind, that's what I recommend. You know, if your goal is like, hey, let me just jump into the help desk. I think that's the wrong plan of action or thought. It's like, hey, I want to be a CIO or I want to be a tech entrepreneur one day, but I'm going to cut my teeth in IT. That's how I would go about doing is what's the end goal? What's that dream job? And then you can reverse engineer from there. Powerful, powerful. So would you say like early on in your career, like would you have a special technique about how to write goals down? Like was there a way that you discovered that, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a right way to write goals down or a different way, whatever work. Like, I feel like everyone's got a certain way they, they write their goals down, um, whatever works for them, but like what works for you? Yeah. In terms of goal setting, what works for me is just focusing on the top three goals and then applying the 80, 20 Pareto rule. What is, what is the 20% that's really creating 80% of the impact. And so that's what I focus on. And then the low priority task, I will delegate to my chief of staff or to my, uh, you know, my team. And so um, that's how you can really focus on the top priority goals and then ask yourself, are these goals aligned with what I want to achieve? And does that compound over time? Because instead of trying to go after huge goals, I, I don't know what the exact stat is, but new year resolutions, I think it's something something crazy, like 80, 90%, um, you know, basically uh, give up, you know, after like setting these new year resolutions. And it's because they don't have enough habits and routines that, um, that they set up themselves up for in order to have a massive impact over time. And that's where I bring in my Kaizen uh, principle. It's my number one uh, principle that I live by. And I also apply it to my business as well. And Kaizen is the concept of continuous improvement or change for good. And we can take this principle with any problem in our life or in our business, analyze that problem and create a solution where we can test it. And then once that solution starts working, we can go ahead and streamline that as a task or a goal that we're going to work, work on every day, every morning or every night. And that starts compounding. And here's the powerful thing. If you can... Kaizen 1% every day, 1.0 to the one power is 37X. So in one year, you can 37X your life in any area if you apply this concept. Powerful, powerful. And like, how did you discover, um, yeah, Kaizen, the Kaizen way? I actually don't under, don't know where I got the Kaizen. Um, I think it was an article I read in my 20s and it was... Um, this concept that uh, Toyota out of Japan uh, came up with as a, a business improvement um, framework. And basically the Toyota manufacturing line implemented this and they said, anytime we see a problem on the, on the manufacturing line, we're gonna raise a red flag. And, and that red flag indicates it halts production. And they fix that problem or improve it and make it better. And then they continue, they, they, you know, start up production again. And this concept is so beautiful because it's about just improving a little bit at a time and using the compound effect. So over time, you will have drastic, remarkable results. So, you know, there's a great book, um, Atomic Habits that talk about these tiny habits that create remarkable change. It's the same concept. It's using the Kaizen principle. So over time, you're going to see results versus, you know, trying to wait for magic to happen overnight or trying to do a miracle uh, breakthrough. This is something that is tried and true and tested and will work if you just put in the time consistently with discipline. Yeah, powerful, powerful. And do you think like, having you like having your first child your daughter at some at such a young age in terms of like how we live these days but um like was that a driving factor like to to think bigger like thinking of ways well how can i think bigger in my day to day absolutely i think i think having children also makes you mature and grow up much faster and it's creates a sense of, I would say, urgency to be able to be a 
provider and a protector um, of your household. So I think it played a huge part um, of why I um, considered sacrificing uh, myself to go into the military. I literally thought that was a sacrifice, um, but I was willing to do it because I knew one, it was going to provide the best medical um, support for my family, uh, for the newborn, and two, bring stability. And then three, it will give me the discipline and shape me up to the man who I need to become in order to be the man of this household. So it did play a huge factor in me even joining the military. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I've got a two and a half year old and um, a daughter, two and a half year old daughter. And uh, yeah, it's just those thoughts run through me of like, how can I think bigger, um, you know, to be the best version of myself each day um, so that, you know, I can, I can be of service to her or help her on her journey in any way. Um, and yeah, before that, it was more focused on, well, me and me and my wife, but because she's there now, it's made me think, it's made me think a little bit bigger, or, you know, a bigger picture. Um, so there's a definitely a massive driving force um, with having her in my life. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have a three-year-old at, actually as well. And, um, you know, it's, it's shifted having um, another kid in such a big gap. Um, has also really enlightened me in terms of just how I, I want to carry myself, how I want to, um, um, you know, be perceived and and how I interact with my kids every day. And it's it's also the legacy, right? Wanting to provide for the family so they can, you know, reach their dreams much faster uh, than we we had to struggle with. Mm, mm. And do you feel like, you know, like – that journey from yeah from basically not become not being an engineer to becoming an engineer like was there any setbacks or obstacles that you had to overcome in in that timeline yeah i think there's always setbacks in our in our life with life events and uh, also just career stagnation and whatnot and i think sometimes you know um we get so comfortable um the setbacks are actually the universe giving us signs that we need to press forward and and get through this uh, lesson and whatnot. So uh, I've had many, many, many setbacks. Like, you know, when I had my first brick and mortar business, I thought I was going to be an entrepreneur and franchise that. And uh, Katrina hit and that was completely out of my control. And that was devastating to not only my business, but my entire family. Um, I was depressed and I hit one of my lowest of lows. Um in that, but from that fall came a new uh, perspective. It came, you know, TK that wanted to break six figures to, you know, become a top engineer in the field, right? Like that drive, that ambition came from that desperation. And I think there's only two ways people will take action. Um, one, they have to be inspired by someone or something. And then two, it's it's like when they have the back against the wall. And I've had my back against my wall so many times, which allowed me to propel and become a catalyst and a fuel uh, to my next chapter in my life. Yeah, powerful, powerful. And so like, yeah, the, going on your journey and that feeling of, is this it? So what? where did that path take you next? Well, it took me down this entrepreneur path. You know, I really um, loved, uh, you know, watching all these companies out of Silicon Valley um, make change and innovate. And and so I've been always like compelled to build something. And I've always been a fan of like Steve Jobs and what he did with the iPhone and just disrupting the whole space. Um, and I always wanted to start something. And that's where my entrepreneur journey began was when I reached the peak of my career in the corporate sector was, Hey, you know, I only got one life. Let me, let me try to build something from nothing. And it really started in the beginning, wanting to do something big um, from an ego perspective and that business crashed and burned, but I learned so much from that failure um, running that business, uh, losing a quarter of a million of life savings because I bootstrapped wow. it and then tried to get it funded and had some runway and and learned a lot. 
but in life, you know, um, anything worth pursuing, you're going to run into a lot of resistance and a lot of roadblocks. And that's a testament, I think, from the universe to see if you got the grit, you've got, do you have the perseverance to make this become a, a true reality? And that's where the fun begins. And um, that's the journey. And if you like the, enjoy, the journey or the process of building something or becoming the best version of yourself, that's the beauty, I truly believe is in the process yeah powerful and like you you touched on that first well i guess you could class it your second business that uh crashed and burned like what was the like the intention of creating it you said there was a bit of an ego side of thing was it it was it was it out to prove to anyone more so than the intention of how like this is actually going to serve more people or was it about you in terms of I'm going to create this business so I can make, you know, I, I can make this amount of money, which means then I don't have to go back to working for someone else. Yeah. So that was like a little over 10 years ago. Right. And it's like, you know, I was in my early thirties. So I, I think I was 32 um, at that time. And it was seeing all the founders on TechCrunch. It was seeing like, wow, like I would read all these biographies or founder journeys. And I'm like, if they can do it, I can do it. And I always had that mentality, like that no one was born a genius, right? Steve Jobs didn't, wasn't born. Like I'm going to create, you know, an iPhone, right? Like it all came through all the hardship. Like he had a huge fall. He got ousted from Apple. Literally. He didn't innovate that company until he hit his lowest of lows and started Pixar, Pixar and, and sold it to Disney. And then Apple pulled him pulled him back into the company. And um, he made his legacy after that. And I would say, you know, um, I lost the original question. Um, the in, I guess the intention of when, like, what was the first intention of creating that business? Yeah, so it was wanting to be on Forbes, wanting to be on TechCrunch, wanting to build a software as a service back in 2013. SaaS was so hot. There was this new coding language that was, um, super trending Ruby on rails. And I was trying to learn Ruby on rails and I was like just diving into this world of tech startups. And I was truly passionate, but my ego was in the way of really understanding the intentionality, the impact. It was a software app. It was basically a cloud project management app for it teams. So it was in my domain of expertise and area, but it was, it was chasing the money, chasing to build a unicorn. And um, I think there was a lot of lessons learned there because I had a huge spiritual awakening at 40. And since then, it's changed the way I think about building uh, business or products and services with the mission um, and the values in mind right from the start, right? It's not the model. It's not how we make money. It's about who are we going to serve? What's the product and service? How is it going to be valuable? Um, and really thinking about that intention right out the gate. Powerful, powerful. And, you know, you, you touched on, you know, you had, I guess you call it a spiritual awakening around when you were 40. So how long after this first failed business did that awakening happen? So the awakening happened actually around three years after I started my second tech startup, which is, I run NGT Academy right now. So, um, you know, um, yeah, three years into this business, NGT Academy, and I had my awakening. And, um, you know, since then, I've just been really incorporating this, um, um, this reality where I'm really focused on the mind, body, and spirit. And really balancing that out and really building a lifestyle where it really balances that out versus back in the day, it was just like work, 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 and that's it. And um, and that's that's not a good way to build a business, in my opinion, because there's a lot of hustle mentality online, and and you don't have to live your life working 80, 100 hour work weeks if you're truly passionate about something and you can find your ikigai, which is another Japanese concept, 
where I can take what I'm truly passionate about, look at the skills that I have or my domain expertise and, and really line that up with my purpose, you know, and what the world needs and how I can make money. If those four things intersect, that's my true meaning. And if I can find that Ikigai early on, you know, the earlier, the better, because that you can just focus on that one thing and, and continue to just do that work um, instead of jumping from one idea to another and to another and to another. Fascinating. Fascinating. And like, I guess for the listeners out there that may have, they've just had a business uh, fail, um, you know, what, what were the techniques that pulled you out of that first failure? Like what was, you know, the feelings that came up obviously after that, like, did you have any, you know, did, did you fall into depression or, you know, how long did it take you to get out of that hole or that pit? Yeah. It, it took me about three months. It, it was the longest uh, um, downward spiral I was ever on because I felt like a total failure, like all the rejections from investors, like it literally, it literally made me very pity. Like, like I literally like was self-sabotaging myself and, and my self-worth was like at a zero and I got so depressed Um I mean, real, real depression. And I think a lot of founders don't talk about this is that as an entrepreneur, you could have su- you could have such severe depression where you will have suicidal thoughts. You could end up that depressed. And, and that was me. I had like seven bucks or 11 bucks in my bank account. And I still remember it. Like I thought like my life was over. Like that's the feeling I had. And it wasn't until I started listening to Tony Robbins um, that got me out of that hole. And, and I started picking myself back up and, and I, I committed to myself at that time that I was never going to ask investors for money in the state of, 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 of just desperateness. Right. And, and, and there was all these moments that I just had this feeling of like, I never want to ever feel like that again. And I think that's what really pulled me out, but also shaped me to, uh, the entrepreneur that I am now is having gone through those setbacks, those major failures. Wow. Yeah. I, I think it's, you know, I don't know if it's for you, but like, yeah, like one of my worst years of being an entrepreneur was uh, the second year of COVID, obviously due to the amount of lockdowns with one of my business, it's a skiing snowboarding brand. So <laughs> no one could go to a ski resort in that. Um, at the same time, Apple brought out like a lot of our Facebook and Instagram advertising was our main way of getting sales. Um, and that was around, I think it was around February when Apple said, oh, we're upgrading our security, but it just destroyed their Facebook algorithm. Um, so we were getting days where we we're just dot, dot, dot in sales and we're throwing money and nothing's changing and we're trying to test and tweak. Um, and then six, seven weeks later, it was the birth of my daughter. Um, and what was interesting is the year before the first year of COVID, we did our best years of sales. So we were like, oh, okay, it looks like this particular business is taking off. Maybe we will plan to have a, our first child since we can't go anywhere. Um, and then in, and then obviously in 2021, it just, everything was happening at the same time. Um, basically nearly went bankrupt and, you know, we had to figure out, you know, day by day, what would, you know, what can we do to keep moving forward? And and I say to a lot of my coaching clients, because one of the things I do is I'm a mindset coach and human behavior specialist, is the one thing that got me to keep going, putting one foot in front of the other was um, the power of breath work and cold therapy. Um, it was just, it just gave me one thing, just enough to, to center me and keep me neutral to come up with the solutions to how to figure to get out of this hole, um, which, you know, obviously we can touch on your, uh, you know, all the things you do with uh, your breathwork expertise. Um, so, yeah, you want to go into that? Uh, to go into that. So I was always like really passionate about personal development. And so I first got introduced to breathwork uh, through Wim Hof um, in 2019. I went to his event. And actually I brought my whole, um, management team. Um, and we had it 
uh, experienced his event in San Jose, California. And it was very intriguing to me. Like, how, how does this guy in shorts climb Mount Everest, right? And how does he, like, with his hand, control like the energy centers and the flow in his body and like thermal regulate his body. Like I just was like, whoa, this is insane. And so I learned how to do um, Wim Hof breathing and that got me really fascinated about breath work. But it wasn't until fast forward, like now three years later where I'm deep into my meditation practices, I'm deep into um, journaling, biohacking, you name it, ice bath, huge proponent, love that you're you're selling these portable ice baths. Um, and so Wim Hof, ice baths, breath work, and then fast forward three years, I have my first experience doing holotropic uh, breath work and completely blown away. Now, you know, I've done uh, many forms of plant medicines uh, to reach altered states of consciousness or work on myself and do shadow work and, and all of that. But at the end of the day, what I experienced through holotropic was just mind blowing because I reached a state where I was in complete ecstasy and bliss. And I've only experienced this before with plant medicine. And what I experienced in my first holotropic was a DMT release coming out of my pineal gland. And um, this is a chemical compound that gets released. Um, you know, if you've seen the documentary, I think it's DMT molecule on Netflix, they had these studies where they were um, doing DMT and smoking it, and they would have these near-death experiences. And all of them experienced very similar kind of um, out of body and very mystical. And, and, and this is basically when the DMT compound gets released from the pineal. And I never thought you can experience that through breath work. And it's on these breath holds that we can experience this. And the breath um, work that I did was about 60 minutes. So it's 60 minutes of deep breathing in and out through the diaphragm up to the chest and doing these huge um um, breath work exercises. And if you do that enough for a long time, you know, you will oxygenate your body and you'll go into kind of like hyperventilation and um, it will start, you will start feeling your, your breath, your life force energy move up and down your chakras. And it will also release traumatic, um, you know, just um, stresses inside the body and, and there's a somatic release that you'll have and you experience and it's just so therapeutic and it's so powerful and I started just diving deep deeper and deeper into it and I've also had another experience in person with a Zen Buddhist uh, Reiki healer um, that uses breath work for um, you know one-on-one -on -one clients to release and to realign themselves to a higher purpose and what I love about this holotropic is that you don't have to use any psychedelics or any plant medicine. And just through the breath, you can reach altered states of consciousness. You can reprogram your belief system. You can reprogram and also release and heal because that's the biggest thing that I didn't even know I had childhood trauma that came up from the breath work and it got released. And it's quite interesting that our body can store in different parts of our body, these traumas. And until you release it, they will stay in your body and it can create stress and it can create illness. And it's just been profound um, to tap into these uh, tools uh, for deeper healing, to do shadow work, to realign and to discover one's true self um, all through this power of the breath. Yeah, it's, it is amazing fascinating and a powerful thing like uh i delved more into the personal development space um purely out of the frustration um with the challenges i was coming up when i was uh, a, a commercial r r real estate agent um mm. that was that was the blessing of that frustration because it made me want to go seek yes. out more answers and more i had more questions and the curiosity and I, I, uh, one of the years, like, I think it was 2014, like I was earning $60,000 and I signed up 
to a coach for 12 months uh, where, you know, you got your monthly coaching call and you had all these assignments and homework to do throughout that year of what you want to do and get clear on on your vision and what you want to achieve. And um, that year, like I wrote down a goal um, to earn $300,000 and I've never earned 300000 at that time, but um, in that process, I went from $60,000 to, to $218,000 um, from real estate uh, investments as well as what I was earning in uh, commercial real estate. But through that journey, um, the coach at the time, he he planted that seed of like, you know, the feelings I had was unfulfillment. I felt like I could be doing more um, and and I wasn't doing what I truly wanted to be doing. Um, and he planned the seed of, uh, you know, do you see yourself as a coach um, to help and serve people? And at that time I was like, oh, I'm just enjoying this stuff for myself. Um, but <laughs> he, he planted enough belief because I didn't believe I could be a coach or help anyone. Um, mm. And, he he had a strong enough belief and conviction. Um, and so I went down that journey and it was like a two-year certification. But one of the workshops, uh, there was multiple workshops of different modalities we had to go through to get this certification. Um, and one of them was a three or four-day day workshop all about the different modalities of breath work so at that point in time we didn't touch on the Wim Hof but we did do like open dyed breathing in pairs we did laying down and and one of them I had to I got to experience that altered state and it was the open face breath work where one person's like just reminding you to breathe in and out whether it was I think it was about half an hour and then and you swap over um, mm. and it was mind blowing. There was about a hundred people, uh, in that workshop. And at the end of it, the presenter just said, you know, put your hand up if, if you had an altered state experience and it, it just blew me away. And that's after that experience, I just was like, I need to know more about all the different breathwork modalities. Wow. And you were facing each other. How were you guys breathing facing? Were you eye gazing as well? So yeah, eye gazing and you couldn't move. You had to just stay on that eye gaze while one person was just, one person was not, one person was breathing and the other person was just making sure you were breathing in and out. So that was the focus. And um, I could see the different layers of beyond the skin, right down to the skull. It was, yeah, it was out of this world, Um, but I was hooked. And how were you breathing? Through your nose or your mouth? It was through my nose, out through my mouth, going. But it was a. Uh, I see. It, it was a. It was a. It was building up to that holotropic um, way. Yep. So like, I've experienced doing holotropic once, um, and I've seen like videos on YouTube and that. It sort of looks. It can spook some people out if you go and watch watch the stuff um but i think i was blocking myself because i visually wanted to see in my holotropic experience like it was there was mm-hmm. a but i didn't get to visually see it was a, a complete sensation and the energy mm-hmm. it came in through like you said through the penile gland the energy um throughout my whole body it was just like i could feel it coming in from the top of my head and releasing out through my and coming in through my head through my hands, through my fingertips and going throughout my whole body. And I've never experienced anything like it. I think it went for about three hours, the session. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. Powerful. The eye gazing is interesting too, because you're basically seeing as you eye gaze into someone's eyes, that is a seat of the soul. And once you get into a deep state, the person will disappear. And, and that's what you experience is, is, a powerful eye gazing, you know, infused with uh, some deep breathing. That's, that's actually a, that's actually a powerful exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's something I facilitate just the like similar to the Wim Hof um, versions, whether that's, you know, bringing people into an ice bath or just doing the breath work. And I guess speaking about it, like I think spirituality and business is connected. Like if you want a successful business, you've got to be doing all the things you can't like, you've got to look at what's going on in your personal life, what's going on in your business life. And there's got to be that synergy for it to all work. But I feel like people think 
there's a disconnect. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think there are certain entrepreneurs that are just unconscious and chasing the money. And, um, you know, I think there's also another set of entrepreneurs that are just cut from a different cloth or or just intention wise. They're 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 not chasing money. They're chasing legacy or impact, um, you know, meaning, um, ikigai, um, purpose. So I think that's the main difference. And if you um, are more of the conscious uh, set of entrepreneurs making, trying to make meaning of life and make impact and service of others, then uh, spirituality becomes a natural um, focus area because now you're operating from your heart uh, versus your head. And so it's like, hey, the, the ego's in the mind and the head, but how about if we operate from the heart, right? And that that's a different perspective. And if we can all operate from the heart, I I I truly believe that the world would be a better place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, focusing on that, um, I think is um, is a competitive advantage, in my opinion, because you know, um, that's what tr truly people now now want these days is authentic people that are caring and that are compassionate and that are really trying to. Um, you know, make the world a better place. Mm, powerful. Yeah. And so what, what happened with, you know, your breathwork journey? Now you facilitate uh, these spiritual workshops. Can you tell us about what, what, what goes on and how did you get to that path of facilitating uh, breathwork and Yeah, I'm a practitioner by trade. So I have to like, just, I have to learn and there's so much of learning I can do. And I have to actually just do it. And so, um, you know, this was really a calling. I, I didn't even think I was going to be a breathwork facilitator and everything just lined up. And, you know, one earlier in the year, my friend invited me to um, training with Montak Chiak in L.A. And he's one of the, um, you know, grand master Taoists um, living in this world right now. And we're, we're, we're just so grateful and blessed to have him. Um, and when I uh, met him for the first time, I was just like, wow, like we just hit it off. And I was, I trained with him for a few days. Um, and then I got in, into this masterclass, Know Thyself and week five with breath work and, and it was holotropic and I didn't even know it was holotropic. And then I'm in Costa Rica and then there's another uh, buddy, a, a good friend of mine running this uh, eco village out there in Costa Rica called Yoko Village. And he's like, hey, um, I highly recommend uh, doing a one-on-one -on -one session with my good friend. Zen. She's like a Zen um, Buddhist um, um, healer and Reiki healer. And I had my first in-person uh, breathwork therapy session with her. And, and it was just like, wow, like all the signs were like, not only have I experienced what this has done for my well-being, but wow, what a powerful tool to uh, allow everyone to experience this. So I started just playing around with different, you know, music soundtracks and, um, you know, my passion for just meeting Montauk. I was like, you know what? Chi Kong is going to open up the energy centers, make the body move, get it primed. And I thought, wow, what if I put Qi Kong in front of the holotropic, right? Get Release all the energy, get the body, get everyone into their bodies. And now I go into the breath uh, experience. And then what if I downregulate with a beautiful sound bath? And it just like all came together, like movement, breath, and sound. That's going to be my jam. And my brother allowed me to facilitate my first one in April in Costa Rica. Wow. And it was wild. It was a wild experience. And it, I, I know my higher self was channeled to me to be able to deliver this beautiful, potent medicine, um, you know, and it was funny because I got really sick two days prior to the event. And I didn't know why, but I ended up fasting for two days. And, um, you know, there are no coincidences. And I truly believe that that's why I was able to deliver such a powerful uh, container. Um, and I would say, you know, my my journey is quite different than any other breathwork, I would say, 
experiences you might have had on your own or going to a Wim Hof event, because it's very shamanic, um, my journey. And 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 it's in, intentionally like that. And I call it the Awaken with Ohm event, because Ohm is the first sound of creation before the breath. And um, we focus on Ohm mantras to activate our energy centers. And my whole goal is to activate your pineal. Your pineal gland, for those that don't know, is your spiritual eye. It's your third eye. And from that, you can experience, um, you know, altered states of consciousness, but you can go deep within yourself just surely through meditation and breath work. Um, and you can decalcify also this pineal gland. There's multiple ways uh, through breath work, through getting off fluoride toothpaste, you know, stop drinking tap water, start drinking or eating more whole greens and vegetables and fruits and things like that. But the breath is one of the fastest ways to activate the center. And um, to kind of give you a quick um, preview, um, you can visit Awaken with Ohm, um, and it's about awakening the power within. So that's what this event is about. It's about three and a half hours. And yeah, it's a beautiful experience. And if you've never experienced it, I highly recommend coming to one of our events. Uh, our next event's on December 3rd um, here in Phoenix. And we're going to have some amazing special guests um, on the show or on, at the event as well to provide the Qi Kong. And then I'll be guiding through the breath work. And then I've got a mystic sound healer and brother Fabian to do the sound bath at the end. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah. And oh, the type of people that you're seeing that are coming to the events, so is it entrepreneurs? Is it uh, a mix of entrepreneurs and just everyday type of people? Like what, what are you seeing? Yeah, I, I, we see a lot of people that are doing, um, you know, deepening their spiritual practice, yogis, um, coaches, entrepreneurs, um, but even people just, you know, at Costa Rica, they were just vacationing, right? And and they're like, hey, let me check out this breathwork event. So I think it up this event applies to anyone, anyone that wants to deepen within their body, they want to heal um, any kind of trauma um, to be able to reprogram their subconscious. So if, if you're about, you know, creating a better reality for yourself, a better life, uh, this is a four hour journey that could, you know, replace maybe four years of therapy. Uh, that's how deep and powerful uh, this could be. And a lot of people are sometimes kind of like skeptical, like, what do you mean? Like four hours, I'm going to change my life. Well, you could change your life in one breath. And that's the power of it. So, you know, without, you know, having a perspective, I encourage everyone to have an open mind because I had an open mind going into this. And I'll, and if I didn't have an open mind, whew, I would have missed out on a lot of good stuff um, for my well-being, right? So this is for anyone that wants to be, you know, um, the best version of themselves, but they want to find themselves and mm. they, they want to find themselves from all the chaos and the hustle and bustle. How do we ground ourselves back to our true self where we're breathing deep, taking five second, second breath, right? Because a lot of people will just breathe and react in their upper chest versus breathing all the way down to the belly. So if you're feeling anxiety, if you're feeling like you're worried about the future or you're traumatized about your past, how about you just take a quick five second inhale through the nose, five second exhale, and you just do a few rounds of this and you'll realize, wow, I could just ground myself and now I feel much calmer. But imagine if you can do that at a deeper level and you could get back to your true self. That's what we do at AWO. And from that place of calmness, of serenity and peace, now I can create. I can create the version of myself that's authentic, that is bold and and you drown out the outer outer world and you truly go within to create the outer world. So my whole philosophy in life is, you know, especially now in my 40s is you create from within and your outer world will create based on your inner world. And 
that's how I really manifest these days. You know, I go within and I ask myself, what does my heart truly desire versus what everyone else is telling me what I should do? Mm, powerful, powerful. Like, <laughs> yeah, if, you know, a, a lot of my clients, I've got a few business clients. So I do obviously mindset and business coaching uh, other entrepreneurs in their businesses. And there's what I'm finding in, in the entrepreneur space is there is a lot of people that either have ADHD or ADD, whether it's, mm. whether they're diagnosed or undiagnosed. Um, I know if I went and did the test, I'd be classed as, <laughs> I'd have ADHD, ADD. Um, and, and it's only in the last few years that I've sort of looked back on like, uh, like on why I didn't really get into meditation like guide, like it was a hard time for me to get into meditation or guided meditation i knew it was good for me yep. i'd do it every day but i just couldn't get to that next level and it wasn't until i did that breath work um workshop that i was like i could connect at a deeper level and stop the thought so i guess anyone that's out there in the audience or listening to this that if you've got adhd or add and you haven't tried breath work but you've tried meditation Go out and try a breathwork modality um, and see if that'll actually stop the thoughts and and bring you and center you in the present moment. Because it's been a biggest thing for me that the more I've done breathwork, now I can go back and do meditations and guided meditations and actually enjoy it. Absolutely. And the reason behind that is breathwork is meditation. Mm. And, and so like, if you've seen like these old women and men, like especially Asian in a park, right? Moving with the wind gracefully, that's Tai Chi. That is a form of meditation. It's an advanced level of Qi Kong. Um, and Qi Kong is a form of meditation with the breath. And it's just got movement in it. So now if you've learned how to breathe and seen the benefits from it, now, yes, you can go into a meditative state where you have no movement and you're just focused on your breath and you're clearing out your mind. And from that state, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper because the first time you meditate, yeah, you're not going to be able to close out all those thoughts, but it's okay. Let them flow, let them go and continue on until you get to a place of stillness, until you get to a place where your mind is not as cluttered or 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 chattery right because we all have this voice or thoughts that just like going 24 7 but it's not our default state it's the society it's all the dopamine hits that we get from tiktok ig facebook just being in this digital world um that has caused our mind to go in in that kind of chaotic uh process running all the time <laughs> mm, mm. yeah it's it's you know it's interesting and like I, like I said I just think it's something I'm really passionate about and I think everyone should give it a go and and play around with some breath work to see which which type of breath work modality works for them because it it it's a life-changing thing like um you know you touched on healing trauma um yes. you know like some of my clients have had you know trauma they're in their fifth late fifties and seventies. Um, and, and through the breathwork modality that I, that I take them on the journey, they are able to heal that past. Um, Absolutely. like you said, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's such a powerful thing in terms of healing trauma. Um, even if you're not sure you've got trauma, like I, I, I didn't even know, like I knew I had a money blockage for so many years, but I didn't know there was a trauma in my childhood connected to it. And I had to go through a breathwork process to see that, to see what that trauma was or set the intention. If I've got a trauma that I don't know about to bring it to the surface to show me. And it's such a powerful thing if you can get to that state and level um and unlock that because what was happening for me is it was running my life like i was a, the program this money blockage was running my life yes. but i could i was aware of it but i couldn't figure out what the cause of it was so the power of breath work brings you to the cause of whatever's going on in your life that's correct it's because 
through the breath work and especially deep breath work, we're able to tap into the subconscious mind. And so during the day, we're living and operating from the unconscious mind. Um, and that's 95% of our brain, literally. And so the subconscious is very um, concrete, let's just say, very concrete. And so like, let's say this is like your unconscious and it's just always doing stuff, reactive. I got to do this, do that. And you're just operating from that field. But the subconscious is just like 5% of the brain where it's like, you know, our belief systems and, and, and trauma and all of that is stored inside there at such an early age. It's like, how do you get into that? And how do you flush that out? How do you reset it? And that's what we do with doing the deep breath work is we're able to tap into that. And it's almost like when you get into that altered state, it's like you step out of your body. It's almost like you can, you can see yourself in a different perspective and that's what's interesting. And then now you're able to reframe that trauma instead of as a victim to learn that was a powerful catalyst for you to grow. And now you are able to reframe that from a different perspective and close that loop and not let it trigger you again. And I think mm -hmm. that's what's powerful. Very powerful. Like to be able to own the things you perceive as a, a as a negative in your life and see how how you can find a way that it's actually serving you and benefiting you in your life and to own it. Yes. It's, uh, yeah. It's, it's a profound, powerful thing to, to, to experience. Um, you touched on, you, you know, you've experienced plant medicines, like what type of plant medicines have you, you've experienced? Yeah. So I, I guess this is probably the first time I've been taught. I would, I'm talking about this publicly. Um, but I've sat, I've sat with um, the Shipibo tribe out of Peru. Um, I've done ayahuasca um, in a sacred container. And so just a caveat, if you're looking at doing plant medicine um, or if that medicine is calling you, it, it, it is definitely a calling. I would not jump into plant medicine wanting a spiritual awakening or wanting to get a new vision for your life. There's other... Uh, modalities or tools that you can do, which is like the breath work we're talking about. Do the breath work, do the journaling, get yourself whole before you start even consider to look at plant medicine. Um, and I have had more, my own reasons to dive deep into plant medicine, but I want to caveat that because there's such a mainstream kind of trend or like, like, like FOMO I would say, lack of better word, in the business or entrepreneur world, even like going on these retreats, ayahuasca retreats to uh, mushrooms, to all, all types of, um, you know, plant medicine um, retreats. And I would I would really look at that as your last resort. But I've, I've sat with ayahuasca. I've done um, the sacred toad bufo, 5-MEO uh, DMT um Joe Rogan talks about it on his podcast. Um, I've done DMT, which is more of a synthetic um, molecule. The Bufo is a, um, I would say, the next level up from a DMT. And it's the more natural um, um, molecule uh, that comes from the Bufo toad, a uh, various uh, frog. And it's a venom that comes out of him. And uh, they dry it into uh, these little... Uh, pieces of glass and and then you smoke it and it's vaporized and and, and you inhale it. I've done peyote, uh, which has um, been practiced in, I think, the Mayan traditions and also in the Native American um, Indians um, in sacred ceremony um, as a gateway uh, to, you know, the spirit world. Um, very powerful. Um, I sat with peyote. Also, it's known for um, as San Pedro. Uh, so kind of two cactus uh, family that carries that mass uh, masculine um, um, compound and, um, and and some mushrooms. So psilocybin mushrooms I've sat with as well. So I would say those are the plant medicines that I've tried. Wow. Wow. And like, I guess with all those altered states from the plant medicine, have you been able to reach some of those states through your breathwork techniques and modalities? Yes. 
So um, I've been able to reach the same state of consciousness. Um, I want to say same. I, it was basically the frequency, right? Yeah. Getting to that frequency. Um, Cause if you can get to a particular frequency, you can get there again, just through the mind and the breath. And so when I experienced holotropic at the peak, like 45 minutes into the journey, I had, I knew I had a DMT release cause I've done DMT before. And so I knew I had a DMT experience and I wasn't on any plant me medicine or, or, or psychedelics. And I was just like, wow, this is insane. And so when I facilitated my first live event, cause I did a couple, I, I did a few over zoom, um, even my sales team, which is hilarious, right? I took my sales team through a journey and they had such profound experiences and like seeing things through the third eye for the first time. And, um, you know, getting into this or even having out of body experiences and there was no plant medicine involved. So that's, that's why I know the power of the breath is that, you know, plant medicine is just an acceleration tool, right? But why do monks and yogis practice have these ancient practices um, around breath work is that and meditation is because they can get to these other realms or dimensions and tap into these other frequencies um, through that. But then it, it takes years or even decades to get to that. And I think plant medicine is just another tool to accelerate that process, but only if, and when you are ready. Mm, mm, powerful. Yeah. I guess that the reason I asked that question is like, if anyone was like, Oh, I don't really want to take a plant-based medicine. It's just starting out on the journey, but would like to experience, you know, another way, which breath work provides so yeah it's uh yeah yeah quite just come to one of our events and you'll be able to experience that and um yeah and we're gonna be doing a worldwide tour next year with our um our launch ohm sleep so awaken with ohm is a live event that is sponsored by ohm sleep uh this is a company me and my daughter started we we're coming out of stealth mode uh this week We've been wow. working on this project for about 16 months now, since last July, and we're shipping the world's most advanced sleeping mask. And wow. it's going to be paired with our Awaken mobile app, where you get to um, experience um, breath work, Qigong, and you'll be able to tap into beautiful soundscapes um, to heal or to manifest um, or to just simply meditate for peace of mind. Um so anyways, that's that's coming soon. And if you are interested in um, deep sleep, because I think the num the best way to become the best version of yourself, which is not talked about um, enough, is not setting goals, it's not journaling, it's not it's none of that actually. It's sleep. You need to make sure you get the best sleep ever. And I promise you, if you biohack your sleep, it will improve all aspects of your life. Goal setting, everything um, will just rise to the top because now you are ready to conquer the day. And there's so many entrepreneurs that think that they just need four, six hours of sleep and they realize they're irritated, frustrated, running on fumes, and they're just not operating at their best um, you know, state of being. So uh, sleep, again, um, sleep hacking is something I'm I'm getting super passionate about now, um, and it ties in with everything around um, mind, body, and spirit. Very powerful and interesting. The like, can you talk a little bit about the like the the head? Like, would you class it as a headset? Yeah, well, it's it's a sleeping mask. Do you sleep with one right now or no? Uh no, no, I don't sleep with one. Okay, um, so you know. Back like 10 years ago, I remember I was biohacking, like trying to get my chili pads, you know, because I warm up at night and um, blackout curtains and all that. And that can get super expensive and not really uh, practical when you're traveling and, and whatnot. So, you know, um, most entrepreneurs solve the problems that they're experiencing. Like all my business ventures have been like that. And, um, you know, I had this vision and idea come to me via a lucid dream. And I woke up just so frustrated because I had earplugs um, in my ear. I had a sleeping mask that was like not on right. And I had my um, 
my iPhone playing white noise, uh, rain and thunder, but it was playing a commercial. And I was like, what the heck? Why is this commercial playing? And it just disturbed my sleep. And I was like, there's got to be a better way, right? And that's the entrepreneur <laughs> aha moment. And so um, I said, why can I have a beautiful sleep mask that has beautiful sulfagio frequencies um, for deep sleeping or binarial beats um, and that has beautiful sound and 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 whatnot. So I created basically an all-in-one sleeping mask. And here's, I'll give you a sneak peek. This is our prototype. This is all black. Um, this is my favorite. We have like four colors, like white and gold, black and gold, all black, and then we have black and silver. And what's so innovative about this is it's the first eye mask with um, Bluetooth that has actually um, EMF protection. So we've partnered with a company called Airstech. And so we have an Airstech chip in here that will block or it will transmute all the EMF radiation coming off your 5G, coming off your Wi-Fi. And so you can have a peaceful deep sleep because inside the bedroom, you might have these devices wandering around and you don't even know that it's actually affecting your 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 auric field and your vibration so to speak and so you know one thing that bothered me with regular bluetooth uh masks that are in the market was that it would bend my ear and it would kind of hurt my ear so we've developed the world's first zero pressure uh ear muffs so just like a bose headphone you get this beautiful comfort around your ear and it's great for side sleepers. So it's 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 very soft. I can I can just, you know, there's no plastic. So um just goes around your your face and you get complete hundred percent blackout EMF chip protection here. You've got your power on and your sound volume, and you can use this for deep sleep, you can use it for meditation, and you could use it for traveling. So when you're out, you know, on the plane. You just put these bad boys on, you got music, deep sleep, whatever you want to do, multi-use case uh, for this mask. Um, and it's launching this Thursday on 1116 on Kickstarter. And you can awesome. just go to omsleep.co and and reserve one. And if you buy if you buy one in the first 48 hours, you'll be able to get um, I think 24 or 48 hours, you'll be able to get 40% off. Wow. Um, so you'll get a hundred dollars off your order. Because these masks will retail for two forty nine um, after the Kickstarter, and then you'll also get a um, hundred dollar or ninety nine dollar subscription to our mobile app for free uh, when you purchase on Kickstarter. Awesome, awesome! They look they they look impressive. Um, like I know for there's people in the like out there. I myself included when sometimes I wear a, a Bluetooth headset, I even get a headache. So the EMF side yeah. of it would obviously you know block that out so i know like a lot of some people don't don't like wearing bluetooth so obviously yeah you've covered that with the emf um yes so, so can you correct. yeah can you talk quickly about the the emf side of it like yeah what absolutely is, yeah what it does yeah so we partner with Aristec, who has 22 patents and eight scientific uh research papers on this and basically it's uh instead of blocking emf it basically transmutes the 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 frequency. So let, let's just call it negative frequency that's coming into your auric field. Um, this chip is going to transmute that frequency into a positive harmonic frequency that your body is used to. So if you look at the Aristec EEG reports, you'll see the brain turns red and it's inflamed when you have the cell phone next to your ear or the AirPods. It's going to create inflammation because of those frequencies. With the Aristec and the Ohm mask, you will be able to transmute all that frequency so your brain can stay healthy and your whole body can be in that harmonic um, default resonance. And that's how the magic works. So now you can still use these devices, but now know that you're protected with this Taurus uh, field that comes out from the chip itself. And what's powerful is that it's battery less. So you can buy our, you can buy our um, mask. I was trying to get one of the chips. Um, and it's doesn't require any batteries. Um, I don't have a sample here, but inside the chip, um, there is a, uh, 
it uses nanotechnology. So there's these resistors um, around the chip that gets booted basically by the EMF uh, around you. The surrounding EMF will power up those resistors and it'll boot up the, the microprocessor. And inside that microprocessor, uh, we have 83,251 circles nano etched inside of that that creates 16 fractals and it creates a hologram um basically that comes out of that like a torus um all around you surrounding you and giving you complete protection uh for your entire master bedroom um and that's how that works wow. pretty powerful yeah it sounds yeah it sounds very powerful yeah it looks like yeah, that'll be, uh, you know, that's helping and serving a lot of people out there. Um, it's, uh, you know, exactly what you said. It's not a, not, not a lot of people are speaking enough about, you know, getting quality sleep. Um, obviously, if you're listening to this and you've, you've got a newborn or a toddler, uh, sleep's the, the number one thing you need. <laughs> that's correct. Like, I can take 30-minute power naps with this thing. I just put it on. Put on a binaural beat and boom, two minutes, I'm asleep. Like that's how powerful this is. And if you, because it gives you instant blackout. And as soon as your brain senses instant blackout, it starts releasing, uh, you know, serotonin and hormones to allow you to go into that delta state um, and then have you drift away into sleep right away versus you messing around and, and trying to, you know, wind down like, it's instant because of that blackout and the comfort as well. And also the sound. Um, but if you don't want the sound, we have non-Bluetooth options still with the EMF protection. So you could still get that version. We also have an earmuff version and we have one without the earmuff for those that don't want the earmuffs. So we have multiple options for any customers pretty awesome. much. Awesome stuff. And um that's yeah, sounds sounds awesome. We'll definitely check that one out. You did touch on Kickstarter. So I do yes. so so if there's any entrepreneurs out there or people that are thinking of starting a business, you're the expert in in crowdfunding. Can you can you touch on that a little bit? So I would say I've become an expert in in raising money from Silicon Valley. So I, I actually raised 18 million in three rounds. Um, with my cu current company, NGT Academy, um, that's going through a merger right now. Ohm Sleep is my newborn baby um, coming out of stealth mode, and we're taking their crowdfunding approach. So instead of selling equity to angels, family, friends, or VCs, venture capitalists, we're using the crowd to basically product market, you know, get product market fit and validation from all these enthusiasts that want an innovative product. So Kickstarter or Indiegogo are two platforms where you can launch something new and innovative. Now you can't just go on there and try to launch a coaching business or launch something super boring. Like, Hey, I'm going to, you know, start selling like, I don't know, like iPhone, you know, cases, right. You need to bring something innovative, right? Like us, we're literally launching the world's most advanced sleeping mess with 22 patents, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is groundbreak groundbreaking and revolutionary. So with that crowdfunding, you can basically raise a pre-seed or seed round, right? Um, you want to have a prototype. Some people don't even have a prototype and crowdfund, but I recommend having a product because there's had been a lot of Kickstarter disasters in the past where founders have an innovative idea, but they never make the product and they never ship it. So all the customers that pre-order lose their money. And I think Kickstarter is getting more better and better about uh, vetting those type of uh, products. But, you know, we... Like what I showed you, this is the final product. This this is shipping to customers, guys. We're, we, we are out of the R&D phase. We've been working on this for 15 months. And so we'll be shipping within 90 days once you start placing the order. And so, um, again, crowdfunding. You could end up raising 100000 to even $20 million. Um, One of my YC mentors um, actually um, was the founder of Pebble Watch, um, if you guys remember Pebble Watch, it was a groundbreaking smartwatch that, you know, came right before the Apple smartwatch. And Eric, uh, the founder, was one of my mentors. And they ended up doing $20 million on Kickstarter. 
How crazy is that? Like wow. literally like yeah. a series A round, like in one one scoop. So very powerful platform to build, I would say a physical product. So, you know, it's more of like an e-com, I would say product um, that are successful on the platform, but it's a great way to crowdfund and not have to give out any equity. And plus you could validate if this product's going to take off or not. Mm, mm, powerful. And like, you know, I guess we touched on, you know, you've got a couple successful, big successful businesses. So th thinking about the one that failed and the ones that are succeeding, what are the keys to the ones that you think, uh, you know, the, the, the massive keys um, for, for the ones that are succeeding? Yeah, I, I would attribute to one thing, it's sales. So if you're a business owner, like don't try to hire a VP of sales and have them try to figure it out and be frustrated. No, you need to be the salesman. I mean, you know, maybe it's not what you want to hear, but that was at least in my experience, the, the fundamental shift. So it's two things. One, the CEO founder being remarkable at sales and learning how to sell your own product, right? You have to be the first evangelist, ambassador, and salesperson. So that was a big rookie mistake in my first startup is I just hired a VP of sales and said, I'm the CEO. I'm just a visionary. I tell people what to do. And that didn't work out, obviously, right? But this, um, I run an eight-figure business um, for NGT Academy. And, you know, this business is built on um, where it fundamentally shifted and we started um, finding success was making sure that you have an amazing product, first of all, but then becoming the number one salesperson and then building the sales team. So I built my sales team from ground up after I fired my director of sales uh, 18 months ago. And business has been booming ever since I took that over. Now I promoted one of my sales guys to become the director to replace me. So it's not a permanent thing, but you know, you want to start with being the number one person and selling your own product. So that's number one. Number two is building systems. So building standard operating procedures and playbooks. And playbooks is the go-to-market strategy for a particular idea or a project. And then building the SOPs that your team could execute on and you could actually measure that um, over time. And so I think those are the two kind of, I would say key pieces of advices is get really good at sales and two, get really good at building systems. Awesome. Awesome stuff. And one last thing, what does the show is called unlocked from within? What does unlocked from within mean to you? Oh, that's an easy one. Um, cause you know, my signature event is about awakening and it's about unlocking the power within. So that's what that means to me is that you actually have all the power you could wildly dream of all locked up inside of you, not in the outer world, but inside of you. And once you really discover that, right, that's the, that's the power. And you can unleash that power. Like Tony Rab Robbins has a signature event, unleash, unleash the power within. And that's exactly what it means. Find your true self, find your ikigai. All of that is within you. And then from there, we can create the reality that we want to manifest. Powerful, powerful. Again, Terry Kim, it's been an honor to have you on the show. Where can everyone um, find, you know, find you? Is it on, you on Instagram, Facebook? Uh, what's the best way to find you? Yeah, best way to reach out um, or follow me is Project Kim, at Project Kim. Um, Projectkim.com if you want to download my Kaisland newsletter. Um, and also, yeah, um, the best thing, you know, just a plug is the best thing you can do for your well-being is grab a, grab an old mask that ships, um, next year, early next year, grab one of these and see how your life changes. Awesome. Awesome stuff, Terry. Thanks again for being on the show. Thanks, Marty. Thanks for having me. Pleasure.
Take care. Thank you again for listening or watching another episode of Unlocked From Within. Please subscribe and like the episode. Please comment and share what insights you got from the interview. And if you could please also share this episode with someone you think it may help. If you'd love to follow more of Terry Kim's work, you can check him out on Instagram at Project Kim. Uh, You can also check him out at ngt.academy if you're interested in knowing more about zero to engineer and the program and you can also find him on instagram zero to engineer and you can also check him out on instagram if you're interested in the bluetooth sleep mask uh that's on instagram omsleep.co and if you'd love to purchase uh the sleep mask you can also check out the link in this description if you're also interested in trying his breathwork workshops you can check him out on instagram which is awaken with om and his website is awakenwithom.com if you'd love to purchase his book which is zero to engineer it's available on amazon and he's also got a podcast which is available on Spotify and Apple, and that's called Founders Unscripted. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can check him out, foundersunscripted.tv. If you'd love to reach out to me for my next workshops, corporate events, or would like to experience a one-on-one Unlocked From Within session, whether that's in person or over Zoom, uh, it's perfect for removing and clearing any limiting beliefs or subconscious blockages uh, you may have Uh, and that's best to make a booking at martyclay.com again thank you for listening to unlocked from within